Hello. Hello. Facebook, you there? Speak to me, Facebook. <laughs> I'm so excited. It's September and we're back with another really exciting episode of The View. I'm Meg Riley on a perfect morning in Minneapolis. Not too hot, not too cold. I mowed the lawn finally. Life is good. Christina, where and how are you? Hi, and hi everybody. I'm Christina Rivera and I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where it is um, you know, just that yucky part of summer where it's humid and hot and all the mosquitoes are out. Um, I, I think we're getting like the top front of the uh, of the hurricane kind of pushing out this way, although we did not take our own graphic marker and uh, and circle it for us to bring it into Virginia. Uh, Michael Tino, how you doing? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino from Peekskill, New York, where it is so sunny outside that I have to keep the curtains closed. It's it's a wonderful, beautiful late summer day here. And um, I am getting ready for the start of the church year. And I do not, I'm lucky that I remembered that it's Thursday because um, that, uh, my head has been in 900 different places so far this morning. And it is so good to be back with all of you. Asia Hauser out on the West Coast, how are you? Good morning. Uh, I'm I'm well. It's Asia. I'm Asia Hauser in Seattle. It's uh, it's bright and sunny, so I'm, my lighting is weird because I don't want the sun in my face, and that's a, a, an unusual problem in Seattle. Um, I just finished uh, hosting over 60 people uh, in three different our whole lives trainings, our our sexuality education program, and I co I was a co trainer for one of them. So lesson learned. While it worked out great, don't co host and train in the same place on the same weekend. So my brain has oozed out of my ears and here I am. Margalee, how are you? I'm very happy to be back. Love you all. Hello, Margalee coming to you from Cromwell, Connecticut. It is a really beautiful sunny day, even though, you know, I'm not as crazy about bright sunny days as most, but even I can appreciate this particular brand of sunny day. So um, I, this, is, will, this will likely be my last show providing tech support. And actually, Antonia Bell Delgado is already providing tech support today as I'm the learning fellow transitioning out of this role. And Antonia Bell Delgado is coming in. It's really been great being on here. I've really enjoyed being on the show at the same time, you know, you're used to seeing us coming and going. And so here's somebody new for you to appreciate and love. What are um, you transitioning to, Margalee? Oh, yes, yes. I am, I'm remaining with CLF as a learning fellow, but I'm transitioning over to the prison ministry department, which is um, really, um, I'm really excited about that. I, I really want to do some work um, along those lines. So I'm really, really excited about that. And as always, we will be monitoring your posts, and, um, your questions, your comments on Facebook and making sure that everyone here knows what you're thinking and what questions you have. Over to you, Antonia, and welcome. Hello. Um, I am really excited to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, yeah, so uh, let's go and do this for you. I'm really excited about what we have to talk about. I can't wait to hear the authors of the book. I think it's going to be a great show. Take it away, guys. All right. Thanks, Antonia. And you're in Delaware? Is that where you are? I am in Delaware. Yeah. Here we are from everywhere. I'm going to uh, turn this over to Aisha Hauser, who is a was a consultant on this new wonderful book, Mistakes and Miracles, and thus knows more about it than the rest of us. Yes, Michael's holding his up too. It's really a fabulous, exciting book, and we couldn't be more excited than we are to, uh, to host the guests. And Aisha, why don't you take it away, introduce them, and go on. So uh, the, the authors of the book are the Reverend Nancy Palmer Jones, who has served as the senior who is serving as a senior minister at the First Unitarian Church of San Jose, California since 2005. She was a founding member of the Unitarian Universalist Association's Just Change Anti-Oppression Consultancy with the late Marjorie Bowens Wheatley. 
and co-edited soul work, Anti-Racist Theologies and Dialogue. Great book if you haven't read it. And before becoming a minister, she was a professional actor and freelance book editor. Karen Lynn is a member of First Parish in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she has played a number of leadership roles related to multiculturalism, anti-racism, and social justice. And she is an engineer in the field of natural language processing, which is amazing. Um, so I want to start with, I got a call. I'm trying to remember when you both called me 2015, 2014, many years ago, way before the teaching. It feels like a hundred years before uh, everything that happened saying, because Nancy and I had known each other from the uh, Urban uh, Disciples and the Beach Foundation had uh, funded urban ministry. So why don't you both start and talk about the genesis of this and how, why you even decided to call me. I was honored and it was great. We've spoken many times over the years. Wow, shall I start, Karen? Um, so I, I was asked actually if I wanted to um, uh, submit a proposal for a book that would talk about multiculturalism and anti-racism. And of course my answer was yes, but I also knew that there was no way I was writing such a book by myself. Um, so in early 2014, Karen and I had already been friends and colleagues through our work with the PCDs, the Pacific Central Districts, um, Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Task Force. And uh, I called her across the country and, and said, would you like to write a book together? And um, she considered it and said yes, and her family said yes. And we went off from there. Um, we knew we wanted to tell stories. We wanted to, we wanted to give people a really up close and in depth look at what is really like to try to build multicultural anti-racist beloved community and um and we had some big decisions to make as we were um figuring out how we wanted to approach writing the book karen how would you describe how we started yeah i think that's um a perfectly accurate way of describing it i, I remember getting the call from you and being surprised but being also incredibly honored um i had as nancy said we'd been friends for a number of years but i also just really admired her as a minister and a person and so being able to being invited to work on this book with her was really just i, I just saw it as an incredible opportunity and um and yeah it it it, it was everything i had hoped for and more we really wanted to make this contribution. We've both been working on anti-racism and multiculturalism for years ourselves and on our own growth trajectory, really. You know, our individual growth trajectory as well as in institutional settings, both our congregations and the and the wider Unitarian Universalist movement. And um, so, so we wanted to create this both to see what was happening to, um, and, and also to, to hopefully urge us forward to give folks both some practical um, uh, encouragement, uh, but also tell the truth about how hard the work is and the joy that comes if you stay in the work. How did you choose the five? I'm very curious how you, how you, you know, you could have, and I do want to point out, I'm hopeful and I was thrilled to, that you, you purposely um, asked Karen, who is a lay leader and a lay leader of color, because you could have easily picked one of your ministerial ordained colleagues and you didn't. So I wanna lift that up. And uh, it would be great to hear how you chose the five congregations. Go Karen, you could do it. Sure, I'll speak to that. Um, so we knew that we wanted to do our own two congregations. So that would be Nancy's congregation, the First Unitarian Church of San Jose and my congregation, First Parish in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We were looking for um, congregations. We wanted some diversity, um, in geography, in demographics, in how long and, and where they were on this journey. Um, back in 2012, um, there had been uh, plans for a book tentatively titled Mosaic, um, and that was um, going to be stories from congregations uh, who had been participating in this so-called Mosaic Makers Consultation congregations who uh, were intentionally on this multicultural journeys. And so while that book was, um, that manuscript was never finished, a number of congregations did submit chapters for that book. And so we started with some of those and uh, talked to the leaders at those congregations um, and they were just incredibly welcoming and, and wonderful. So we ended up with uh, the, first, uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Annapolis, Maryland, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix, Arizona, and finally, All Souls UU in Tulsa. Anything to add, Nancy? 
Yeah, we wanted, I think you mentioned all of those differences that the diversities that we were looking for. Um, we had this source material from either of those chapters that folks had written uh, for the unfinished book, and as well as other, other um, ways in which these congregations had sort of shown up on the scene. But, you know, each each congregation deserves a book of its own. And there were so many other congregations that we weren't able to cover. I, I remember, Karen, that we, we started with ideas about covering many more than five. And finally, we got realistic about it, right? I think we started thinking, oh, we could do seven, we could do nine or something like that. But, um, but thank goodness, we got really realistic about it. Then we got, um, we got some grants, thankfully, from the UU funding panel to do site visits. So we did site visits to all five of the congregations, meaning that I also went to First Parish in Cambridge, where I had some history. I had gone to that congregation when I was in divinity school, and Karen came out to San Jose, um, and she had also attended worship at San Jose some of the time as well. So we, we kind of knew each other's congregations, and then we did these really in-depth site visits for the other three as well. I want to get into the meat of the book, because there's a line in yep. the book the, the whole book is extraordinary. I read it more than once. So here's how real this book is. And, mm -hmm. and there's a, the reason why I want to lift up this one line, because I think it's the first time that um, truth from a white UU was stated quite in this way. And it's now in a book. So it was in the Annapolis, Con I believe, I'm almost positive, the Annap An Annapolis congregation, um, where you were talking about the tension with uh, Reverend John Cresswell and folk, a black minister, black male and what he was bringing. And this white person said, what's wrong with wanting to be with other white people? And that's significant. And I wanna get into the meat of the stories that you tell because when I read that, I said, yeah, you're now naming it. Let's talk about that. Because before that people, no, 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 we wanna be, we want to be multicultural. We want to be diverse. And finally, someone was simply saying, this is my comfort, this is, what I want, what's wrong with that. So, um, and please uh, everyone else jump in, but that was, it was so um, uh, affirming because we know that that's true. We know people feel that way, but if we don't talk about it, then we can't address it and we can't go anywhere. So I was super appreciative how genuinely real, uh, how authentic the stories were told are in this book. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. I. It's a complicated statement, isn't it? When um, I can understand that feeling as a white person, um, I, I can understand the feeling that that feels like shame or blame. You know, when um, when we fight, white folks are are urged and pushed to to say we need to really change everything about the way we work in the world and um uh and how just how hard that is i understand the desire for comfort i understand the desire to be um to, for the familiar in our spiritual homes as well um, and that's one of the reasons that we talk so much about how a major element of this of this process of trying to build multicultural anti-racist beloved community is um, especially for folks in any any aspect of the dominant culture to become comfortable with being uncomfortable and I think I think the thing about that that discomfort is that we we need to know we need to we need to have the we need to hang in there long enough to experience that that there is so much more life and joy on the other side of that discomfort so much more life um, so the other thing that's that's so I can empathize with that, with the statement. And at the same time, um, uh, uh, it breaks my heart a little bit um, because it, it feels a little bit like maybe that person hadn't gotten to that other side yet, number one. And number two, a lot of times we have that statement being said in front of or to people of color and how painful that is. I mean, Karen, you you actually had that experience of, of somebody saying something like that to you. Yes, so I did. It's hard, right? Right. I was wondering if I could add a little bit to that. Um, so yeah. I think it is it is natural to want to be uh, comfortable in your place of worship, and yet I think the whole point of of having a religion, of having a faith, is is to be called to something more. And so it's for this reason that the uh, chapter one of our book uh, is entitled "The Call of Our Faith" and really explores, okay, if if we want to be 
full human beings and 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 live into the the fullness of what we all are what do we need to do um and, and that's a tricky question for a non-creedal faith but um i think that that's how you get past the um the desire for for this comfort is to remember that you are called to something more yeah we actually we actually believe that that our faith calls us so clearly to doing this work that we can't even really call ourselves Unitarian Universalists unless we're willing to engage in it. Now, that doesn't mean we're all going to be equally happy or comfortable about that. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy at all, but that's not the promise of the faith that it's going to be easy. In fact, um, seems like Unitarian Universalism poses some really tricky challenges in many directions, and, uh, and yet it's so clear from the foundations of our faith that, and we've never completely lived into it, right? But we're trying. And that's what the book is kind of about, is that some people are so dedicated to this vision that they're having these experiences that are the mistakes and the miracles of, uh, of doing this particular work. Uh, can and I, I chime in? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think it's important to, to note that that process through discomfort um, it's a process and that, and that the goal isn't to like, i I hear what you use so clearly saying we, you know, we just want to, we just want to get to the comfort part again, like, okay, maybe we're willing to go into the discomfort, but the, the only goal of going into the discomfort is to get to that other side that you were talking about and, and trying to represent them to, you know, actually the reason why we come to church is to, is to actually be uncomfortable together. Like that's that's actually why we're supposed to be doing this work together um, is because, you know, you can go out to a lot of different places to do racial justice work. Why do we do it together as Unitarian Universalists? Why do we do it together in community? And it's because we're supposed to be in that discomfort place together. Um, and And I think that, you know, in that goal of always trying to get through it, um, we lose some of the beauty of being in it together. I yeah, that's a say, really good point. I really appreciated that you started with the theological and the, and the faith development aspects of this work, because, I mean, as everyone's been saying, I think one of the my image lately, because I watched that movie Truman finally, you know, is that being in an all white world is like being in this little fake weather system and think and thinking it's everything and I think that the discomfort is realizing how little we know as white people if we're only with other white people and if we're gonna claim anything like universalism we have to break through that I mean and and I feel that there's this impulse I only want to be with white people and I want to claim that we have the whole truth and it's like it, it it disrupts that um, it's a comfortable belief. It's also a lie. And so do we want to have the comfort of lies or do, do we want to live into the discomfort of really complicated, multifaceted truths? I think that's what we're really wrestling with right now. And I feel like the timing of your book couldn't be more perfect to give people some real paths forward and also to affirm that it's, it is difficult and people do say hurtful things and we're still here. Yeah, I think um, a couple of things you're reminding me of. Christina, thank you so much, because I, I can hear how even my language of saying getting through the discomfort to the other side is like there's a goal or like there's an like there is another side where it won't ever be uncomfortable again. Maybe maybe we create that kind of heaven on earth. But and and that's my typically kind of my my typical longing for um, for the good news. Right. Um, uh, is part of my my personality, but in truth, um, but in truth, it it's it's that it's messy and it's all in there together. The 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 joy and the sorrow and the difficulty and the not. And at the same time, Asia, in our conversations lately, we've also been talking that among the three of us, we've also been talking about that level of compassion. That when somebody says, when a white person especially comes up and says, um, you know. I don't know about this, talking about this white supremacy culture stuff. It's just our white supremacy. I, I, I don't know about talking about that. That, that. that part of the response, part of the response can be a compassionate one. 
of, yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's really hard. And, and then not letting that stop the conversation or stop the growing or stop the learning or stop the relationship. I think that's the really key thing. How are we building those relationships? Um, and in fact, that's really part of the point of our book. And what we hope is kind of a, a counter narrative to, to folks who feel like we're focusing too much on, um, on this issue right now on dismantling white supremacy culture. Uh, we're using that language really intentionally. Language evolves. It's not always the language we've been using. We're, we're, it's the best language we could, we know right now to describe the soup we all swim in, um, what in, infects and, and influences all. But, um, uh, but this, these, these stories are counter narratives about, um, uh, about how, how, how possible and doable and what the, what the value of those relationships are and what it feels like to live our Unitarian Universalist faith in this way. I also want to name that um, you're, you, this, I think this is the first book in print that, that talks about the white supremacy teaching. And I want to lift up an appreciation <clears throat> that you're clear, uh, and this isn't about taking credit, it's about not having erasure you're clear that it was three religious educators of color because one of the things that I've noticed, <clears throat> even from other people of color, I'm, I'm heart disheartened to say, is folks celebrate the three, tri the tri-presidency of, you know, Reverend Bill Singford, Reverend Sophia Betancourt and Dr. Leon Spencer without getting to how that happened or even naming how that happened. And, and the, that's significant because you're erasing religious educators, non-ordained leadership, you're erasing how that it didn't come from nowhere. So I want to lift up and appreciate um, that you both didn't do that in your in your introduction, um, and and you name it clearly. And I think yes, the relationship because I was naming the story that someone came up to me and said, you know, I'm having trouble with the words white supremacy. I said, yeah, it's really terrible, isn't it? It is hard, and this is why we're going to keep using that term. So um, it's relationship and who we are called to be as you named in the beginning. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to not put aside my calling as a Unitarian Universalist to save a relationship either. Uh, there, I've definitely had relationships be broken um, and that's the reality of it as well. Yeah. Yeah, Karen, Karen it's reminding me a little bit of the, um, uh, when you talk about the, the erasure of the religious educators, it really reminds me of the, of the issues around intersectionality that we talk about a little bit too in our, in our book, don't you think? Yeah, um, we, we've mentioned the word relationship quite a bit now, and that is really um, a, a, a central theme in our book is that it's all about creating these relationships of trust. And that's one thing that Nancy and I um, tried to do. We, we've, we've got different identities between the two of us. She's a minister. I'm a lay person. She's 20 years older than I am. Uh, you know, uh, she's white. I'm not. Um, and so there there's there are times when we did see things differently and we had to work through that. And, and it was modeling that relationship of, of trust that uh, we hope is, is evident in the book and encourages other people to, to build these relationships, even though sometimes that might be difficult. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we decided to write the book in one voice instead of having chapters from a whole bunch of different people. We're sort of hoping that we've, we're inviting everyone to take this journey with us. Um, and that even though we're writing, we're trying to tell the stories which have been so generously shared with us by folks, passionate champions, naysayers, um, you know, religious educators, musicians, uh, uh, choir members, ministers, uh, you know, sort of across the board, tell these stories from these different congregations. Um, still, you can hear and see our presence on the, on the page. Um, and then both at the beginning and especially at the end, we talk about how our own relationship has grown and changed and also the impact it had on our experience of Unitarian Universalism to do the, to do the research for this book. Yeah, Karen, you, you wanna talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, one of my biggest learnings, and it's, it's almost comical now to think of, of how naive I was, is that I thought when we, when we started doing this book that we would be like journalists and we would go and interview these people and try to be true to their stories. And I had no idea that I was going to be so personally affected um, by, by listening to, to the stories that were so generously shared. And um, you know, there were times uh, when talking to people of color who'd had difficult experiences that I was reminded 
reminded of some of my own experiences and and it was really hard and and you know there were times when we'd finish an interview and I'd go out to the rental car and I'd be crying and wondering if I could stay in Unitarian Universalism so I think that just goes it, it speaks to how deeply personal this work is um, and uh, that was that was one of my major learnings yeah and because of the relationship between us and that incredible intimacy that got that, that deepened um, a thousandfold through our doing this work together I got a chance to see in an incontrovertible way you know in a way that I I did not want to look away from because I love you and also I could not look away from because there we were in that rental car together you know um, I got a chance to see what and feel um, just empathetically by being in the car with you, what, what that pain was like. And it was hard. I felt a lot of those things um, uh, that many white folks feel um, in the face of this. I, I, you know, this, I, I feel like I'm giving my life to this faith because of my vocation. Um, and, um, you know, there isn't any other place for me, really. I don't know what else I would do literally with my life. And so to feel it's raw and damaged places in a way that I could not just reframe it, you know, to make it better immediately um, was challenging to my sense of where we are as a, as a religion as well. And uh, it caused me to do some really deep soul searching too. And I have to say that my main, my main, my main response, especially early on, as I began to confront this so directly was two was it was one major thing but but had two elements to it and, and and it was just that i'm i'm in i'm just in no matter what happens i'm i'm in this for life so i'm in this relationship with you karen for life and i'm in this relationship with unitarian universalism for life and i'm in this relationship the sense of call to try to help transform our our own institutions our own systems and and, and make possible these relationships, um, you know, for life. And that's what we were seeing in, our, in the congregations we studied too, I think, is that where, where there was a, you, you know, the, all of us who have congregational um, roots uh, of, of all sorts, but, but we know that it, congregational life is about so much more than, um, you know, than, than any one issue. Um, so there, there is the pastoral care and there are all, all these other things going on at the same time that we're trying to renew, revise, uh, dismantle old systems and, and live into a new way of being with each other. Um, but in each of these congregations, there's a stick to a persistence and an adaptability, like, you know, a willingness to experiment, learn, um, to experiment with something and learn from it to, you know, we're going to try this path on this road to multiculturalism. And if that doesn't work, we'll look at it, analyze it, and then we'll, we'll try another. It's just a, it's a lifelong journey. Can you describe how you did the site visits, how, how the conversations unfolded, how the stories came to be? Did you meet with people in small groups? Did you meet with religious professionals separately? I'm just curious how you, because they're complicated stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we did all of that, really. Um, we, we spoke with ministers, we spoke with religious educators, we spoke with uh, congregants in both small groups and in personal interviews. Um, it, was, it was interesting that I think in, in a few of the cases where we did, um, you know, uh, do, have, have interviewed people in small groups that we, 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 we could see the, that change was happening even as we were asking the questions that we were asking. Um, and this, again, goes back to my, my naivete thinking that we were just going to go and observe and, and nothing was going to change, I, th I think, as a, as, a, as a consequence of the conversations we had. Um, you know, people's, people's minds were, were maybe changed, or at least people were drawn to think, uh, think about things in a way that they hadn't before. Nancy, do you want to add to, to that? Yes, I think that was kind of the really, a really wonderful thing about it. We, we knew we weren't journalists, you know, so that we knew that we were um, entering into these conversations as conversation partners. Um, so although we wanted to primarily be listeners, um, 
we also engaged. We also had things to offer and questions and, and, and uh, our own experiences. So there was a real back and forth in these conversations. And I think we all walked away feeling um, transformed by it. But the other thing, the other thing, and this was a really surprising piece to me, um, we did a whole lot of work on the history of each congregation too. Um, and the discovery of how powerful it was to see what's in the DNA of uh, what's what are the what are the core threads that run through the narratives of these these congregations and where are the tensions you know where's the where's the conflict that's caused conflict avoidance for decades or where's the strength where's the creativity we're gonna you know like at Phoenix we're gonna hold those children's education religious education programs out of the back of a station wagon because we don't have um, a campus for children's religious education um, where, where are those core strengths that are in the DNA um, that people can draw on now? And, you know, a lot of congregants aren't really thinking about their history. We're also engaged in our present tense life. So we're also hoping that this, there's a sort of invitation to the people who read this book and, and the people who engage in this work to also go looking at the history to say, oh, there's that pattern that we keep repeating. Let's undo that. Or, oh, look how, look how brave we were in those days. Uh, look how brave our ancestors were. Let's, uh, let's call on that courage. That's in our DNA too, you know. I'm wondering, um, especially for, for folks out there who haven't yet read it, uh, and I haven't yet read it, it's been sitting on my desk for about four days now. It arrived from, from the In Spirit bookstore and it's gorgeous and I, and I, it's just, it arrived at exactly the wrong time to read it. So I will, I will admit my, my, um, my own, <laughs> uh, no worries, my own failings here. Uh, but I'm wondering if there are particular, particularly a couple of stories from uh, people of color in the congregations that you might lift up as having sort of transformed your thinking about uh, Unitarian Universalism or um, informed the way you thought about this theology or these common threads. I, I, I'm aware that the one quote we've we've actually put out there from the book was about the discomfort of a white person. And I, I wanna tell some of the stories of people of color that I trust are, are in here. And I know, I know you two well enough to know that you listen to. So are there a couple that you wanna lift that you can lift up here? Mm -hmm. Gosh, there are so many of them. I'm um, just uh, give me a minute to think ab about which one I want to yeah, share. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, first of all, I, I just want to mention, um, as as I'm thinking about this, that in our own chapters, um, the the chapter on First Parish in Cambridge and and the chapter on uh, First Parish uh, First Unitarian in San Jose, we chose to write those chapters in the first person because we wanted to tell our own stories, um, and 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 show people what it is really like to do this work as a lay person of color or as a white minister. Um, so there's a lot of my my own personal story in there, and and in some of the uh, the challenges that I've um, uh, that, that I've, I've had in this faith, um, being very, very honest and very vulnerable about that. Um, I, I would say that um, some of the stories that I, I heard from people of color, I was, um, I was surprised by, I, I used to think that my experience was kind of unique, um, and it's really not. Um, and so we heard stories about people's resistance to anti-racism, um, coming up and the effect of that resistance on people of color. Um, in particular, uh, one, one thing we hear a lot about is, oh, well, I don't like the process by which we're doing this, which I think is, is usually a way in which people try to avoid talking about the true discomfort that they're feeling. Um, and so that was something that came up that really resonated with me. Um, yeah, give me a minute to think a little bit longer and I'll see if there's any other stories I want to lift up. Well, there were some really cool things at the, in the chapter um, uh, that's about the Phoenix congregation. Um, the, really, the majority of the chapter it focuses, um, it lifts up these voices of uh, people of color, whether they're on staff or lay members. And, um, and, and I, one of my favorite parts to witness in that site visit, and that's recorded in the book as well, Karen, is, is are the conversations between you and Jimmy Leung. And that, uh, I just remember there's a moment when, remember Karen, you were talking about your own kind of racial identity development and what it felt like to grow up in Kansas as a unique, uh, 
girl of um, uh, of color, an Asian American person, and um, with parents who were eager to to um, to blend in, and um, and what that felt like, and and that Jimmy's response, you were speaking to my soul, sister. That just uh, was so moving to me. I mean, it was really it was breathtaking to get to be part of that conversation. Do you remember that yeah, part? Yes, I remember that conversation very well. Um, and 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 we were talking, Jimmy and I, about the challenges of growing up Asian American and how no one really taught us how to be an Asian American, what, what it meant to be a person of a color in, 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 a, in a dominant culture white world. And so um, I think both of us had experiences in our faith where we were forced to confront that, um, sometimes painful. Um, and so, so, yeah, Jimmy and I both, both uh, re uh, remembered similar, similar experiences with this not knowing how to be who we are and um, and having to learn that. I was going to lift up the Phoenix congregation and I have to because that chapter I think I emailed both of you I don't know if I texted you um, finding out about the sculptures of the black women that were meant to represent the four girls who the black um, girls who died in Birmingham Alabama frankly struck me as horrifying. And I know obviously the congregation has different history with it, but I, I said, tell me it's not still there. And you're like, no, it's still there. Um, and so the I think out of all of them, the, yeah, I had different emotions with each chapter reading about each congregation. But when Michael asked his question, I thought of the Phoenix congregation where I think the stories of folks of color um, was to me, uh, hit me, um, the, resonated with me. Uh, in different ways so but i don't know i don't love the idea of those statues but i just want to name that well right and one of the things that was really interesting is that there were you know uh there were people of color who who love those statues who feel like actually because of the relationships involved between the sculptor and the the african-american member of the congregation who was such a um a, you know pillar of the church at the time that they were created and who was responsible for making sure that those sculptures you know were were installed in a garden um on the campus um because of those relationships and then because of um uh i think i'm thinking about elena saying right karen saying um uh, you know, that she would lead tours. And when she got to that part of the sculpture garden, she felt like it, she felt like it was saying something else, not just um, a white artist uh, uh, continuing the process of owning or, um, or appropriating bodies of color, you know, but and, and, um, and let's just be clear, creating women without clothing. Yes, that's true. I mean, uh -huh. right. I, yep. I mean, yep. yeah, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. No, it's very, very tender. It's very, very tender. I'm just, I just thought that it was, it, that was part of the, that was part of the journey was that, um, was the, the range of thoughts and opinions and how it, it, it doesn't, um, yes, a deep, deep pain around all of that. And, um, and, uh, you know, it's that old truth that we can't, um, uh, we can't just uh, we we can't just assume that um, that uh, that uh, all members of one group are going to feel a certain way, right? Um, and that's part of the messiness and even I would say the beauty of uh, of this work because it means we have to stay in relationship and we have to really listen to each other instead of um, uh, and we have to listen to to how the systemic forces are at work, which is part of what you're talking about, Meg, as well, and Asia too, right? Yeah, one thing that we we really wanted to to do, and and I think we did, um, especially in the Phoenix chapter, was to re really remind people that people of color are not a monolith. We don't all think the same way. We don't all have the same reactions to things. We're all at different parts in in the journey. And I, I remember in Phoenix, we talked to um, two couples. We talked to one couple um, that was so incredibly happy to be in the congregation, and were just completely in love with Unitarian Universalism, and were happy to share parts of their culture in whatever way they were asked. Um, and then we dealt with, we, we, uh, we interviewed another couple um, who had been in the church for a number of years and had, um, I, I had served in various leadership positions, were very um, involved in the, in the, in the congregation. Um, but one thing that was really interesting to me is that when they spoke about the congregation, they kept saying they, they kept saying the congregation, they, they do this and they are like this, which to me really spoke to um, the degree to which they felt or did not feel a part of that congregation. 
And yet they would go and sit in the front row every single Sunday so that folks could see that there was this couple of color right there. And, you know, let, you know, we're, we're here to welcome everybody. Um, whereas other folks in the congregation, uh, other members of color would, um, you know, one person was like, yeah, let me go talk to the new people. Um, and the other person was says, I am so not that person. That is not the role I want. And it feels like tokenizing to me and I don't want to do that, you know? So all of those, um, variations uh, brought depth and complexity and, and, um, uh, and nuance, I think, to the stories. That's why, we, that's why we decided to tell these stories in so much depth. We go into a lot of detail about structures and congregations, but also about people's thoughts and feelings and their personal experiences. I think one of the things that, um, that I feel was, uh, I, I guess I want to say that I feel like it was kind of brave um, on our part was that we also talk about what it means to be um, through through our deep depth of relationships and con conversations with people, we talk about what it means to be um, uh, a minister of color and, and what those struggles are. We tell John Crestwell tells his story, um, and uh, and we talk about some of the conflict that arises there. And um, you know, how do we hold? How do we how do we honor uh, everyone's um, need to grow at the same time that we don't just um, reinscribe uh, the, you know, the the racial prejudice, the the white supremacy attitudes about about different kinds of perfectionism and stuff like this that um, run through our systems. Is that clear? Yeah. I feel a little and nervous even <laughs> even saying it. Antonia, you had something. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I was wondering um, the difference in the two uh, colors of couple that you were talking about. I was wondering the difference in time that they had spent at the congregation, um, because I know that there's really an issue with retention of people of color in congregations. So the people who are gung-ho and ready to do all the things, I don't know if gung-ho is the word I actually wanted to use, who are excited and ready to do all of the things, were they newer members and the people who use the word they, were they older members, were they, did you look into that? Yeah, that's a really astute question. Um, yeah, the people who who were really enthusiastic were in fact newer members, um, and and those who who used the word they uh, had been in the in the in the church for a while. I, I think that there's there's an arc that a lot of people of color go through where they first discover Unitarian Universalism and 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 the theological freedom and and the the, the support for finding your own truth, and and they just completely fall in love with this with this idea and are so excited about the religion, so excited about the faith. And then the longer they stay in, in these congregations um, that are, are predominantly white, the more that they get a little bit um, like disillusioned and, and start having these questions about whether or not they choose to stay in the faith. Um, and those that do stay do so with, um, with a, a really, deep understanding of what it means to stay and, and the sacrifices they will have to make to stay. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you that, that there, there is a difference between newer members and, and those uh, of, you know, members of color and, and those who have been, been in the religion for a while. It's almost like we're in a dysfunctional marriage. I mean, that's how I feel. It's like, well, I made this commitment. I have love for you. And this sometimes this is abusive and how much am I let, you know, we teach people how to treat us. So how do we teach Unitarian Universalism to treat us um, black indigenous and people of color? How do we do this? And um, so I want to speak to Nancy. You, I think it's, a, it's one of the chapters uh, in the Annapolis chapter and John Cresswell and folks saying, you know, the white folks feeling like they can't uh, criticize John because he's black. And so I've been in that position where people um, feel like they can't uh, give feedback. And here's what I say to that. It is perfectly acceptable to actually comment on the work that I'm doing and on my job. The part that is racist is uh, suspicion and questioning motivation. Why is she doing this? What's her hidden agenda? Like I tell people, my agenda is all over Facebook. It's not hidden. Um, so the suspicious part, not the, there are ways to give feedback. There's even books about it on how to, you know, criticize or not even criticize, give feedback or critical uh, feedback for, for folks in a system. But the suspicion part, the why, the why do we, that's the part that is frankly racist. So I just want to name that. 
Yeah, I think assumptions in general, those assumptions about, um, uh, you know, even, you know, is this really your work? You know, there, there were such hurtful things that were said. Um, so painful, so painful, which I just, I, I, I guess when we hear about that, I know um, uh, Eric Law read the book and, um, and he said he would sometimes be sitting on the edge of his seat as he was reading the book, uh, going, oh, gasping when some of those painful things um, uh, were said and experienced and wondering how in the world are people going to come out of that uh, uh, broken, broken, dis, you know, destroyed sort of relationship. Um, so to me, when we see the harshness of the experiences um, laid bare like that, um, and maybe have to gasp some, some white folks who think that we're, you know, I mean, like, like me really, you know, who think, well, we're, maybe earlier on, uh, think that um, we're not that bad, we, we mean so well, uh, and we see the real impact and see how deeply these prejudices run. Um, it just speaks to how, um, how we have to stay on it. We have to stay on trying, we meaning this, this we I'm talking about is people like me need to stay on raising our consciousness, need to stay on um, uh, um, excavating those old, old assumptions that we were, we were bred on uh, so that we don't then dump them on, on people who, uh, on other people. I wanted to ask about, I haven't read the book either, um, but I want to, I wanted to ask about youth of color, especially youth of color who grow up Unitarian Universalists and the impact of Unitarian Universalists on youth of color when there is a othering of youth of color and, and how it's almost like, no, it's not almost like, and how they grow up as second class citizens in a religion that is supposed to be so welcoming and open and, and recognizing the worth and dignity of all people. Did you talk about that in the book? We talk about some families, um, some some mixed race families, uh, and and we certainly we certainly speak with um, uh, parents of color, uh, and we you know we have a few interviews with children in the book, but um, but but we didn't dive into that as much as we initially wanted to really. Um, maybe, it, I, I, yeah, Karen, what would you else would you say about that? Yeah, I don't think we talked to any youth of color who had been raised Unitary Universalists, but, um, you know, I, I, I do, I, I, I agree, and I, I wonder about the impact of being raised uh, in, in a faith where they are, are sometimes considered other, and I'm, I'm grateful that there are, you know, some resources for, for youth and young adults of color um, uh, in, in the institutions, um, but yeah, we, we did not explore that as much as, as we would have liked to. Yeah, one of the one of the things we were really inspired by and and driven by, I mean, sort of our sense of accountability was certainly to um, uh, to the youth who've been the leaders. So often, the leaders in uh, and I'm thinking primarily of youth of color have been the leaders in um, in our moving forward in this work. Um, and so, in a sense, um, we're kind of we're kind of we are addressing more. Um, folks who are adults right now uh, in the same way that that the youth uh, climate work is really addressing adults saying you know you have got to get your act together because you're you're uh, you're ruining our lives and um, I think that's part of the underlying accountability but we didn't talk about that as much did you have that experience yourself Tanya Antonia Antonia I'm sorry oh. Oh, I'm no. sorry, I heard some people calling you with a shortened name. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm raising uh, both of my children grew up Unitarian Universalist. Uh -huh. So I haven't had that experience, but I definitely see that experience playing out in their uh -huh. lives, and especially in places that um, I don't want to say they don't have access, but don't promote um, more national or regional um, uh, opportunities for leadership and there's a there's a strange thing with leadership because leadership also others you 
So if you just want to be like the kids in your youth group, and now you're raised to this person of leadership, not based on, maybe not based on your ability to be a leader, but more based on your identity, that's also an issue. I think it's important in Unitarian Universalism that especially with people of color and youth of color, that we don't decide that and especially our youth need to be the pre people to educate other people because of their identity. Mm -hmm. They should have the same opportunities as youth who are not youth of color to decide to be leaders if that's what they choose to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think it puts an extra burden on youth of color and furthers further others them when they have these experiences. Yeah. yeah Amen. I want to, I don't want to lose Margalee because I think Margalee wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, I did. I wanted to say something back um, after you mentioned um, questioning your motivation um, as a person of color. But to me, it's, it's, I think there is also the other point of um, more than motivation, a questioning of whether or not you're up to the task. I think, um, you know, a need to uh, make sure that uh, you're doing it right. Um, you know, I think for me, that's where the issue comes in. Um, uh, my um, white colleagues are given greater leeway to make mistakes and to just, um, to just be and understand that these things happen um, in ministry. But I think as a, as a person of color, I feel I need to be extra careful. I need to be clear. Um, you know, I need to make sure my, my T's are, are, you know, so that's, I think even more that the, the, um, the uh, expectation that you, maybe you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that, I, didn't, I didn't mean to make it all <laughs> quiet. <laughs> no, there's just there's so much to say about that. Yeah, well, I think it's exactly true. I think I think our white colleagues, no matter where we are on the religious professional spectrum and Unitarian Universalism, um, have to make less mistakes, be much more. It's a it's a this is emotionally exhausting work for any leader of color in in predominantly white space. That's a fact. And, and there's, I don't really, unless you've complete, I don't, I don't know. I can't name, I mean, I'm thinking like maybe others aren't emotionally exhausted, but I personally haven't been in contact with other leaders of color in this faith who aren't emotionally exhausted from, and lay leaders as well, um, who just, like I said, it's the toxic marriage. It's like, I love this faith. Oh my gosh, this faith makes me so exhausted. What am I doing? This is so great. What am I doing here and why? And the tears and the the outrage. It's it's true, Margalee. And um, I hope that isn't lost on white folks ever. Well, and I think also, Asia, not to speak for you, because I would never, but but something I've heard again and again is leaders of color basically being gaslighted by our faith too, right? So it's you're emotionally exhausted. And then white people come along and say, "Oh, you're not, you're not emotionally exhausted, right? Like that, that, <laughs> that didn't, that didn't, that didn't happen like that um, again and again and again." And I've seen it happen. And um, or I've been told, "Why aren't you over it? Why aren't you over it already?" Um, when you know there's a discussion of having a white minister be emeritus who was heinous, heinous to me and other women, and but I have to say get over it because he was nice to every other white person. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think those are some of, I mean, that seems to me like exactly what you're talking about, um, Asia, or, or why Nancy and, and Karen, you know, are writing this is, is to, it, you know, it, at least for me, it affirms that, you know, what we are saying, we're not just saying, for the sake of saying it, like there's, there is context to this, and and so I really appreciate the way you all framed, you know, going into this work, um, in, into this book, um, why you were doing it, and and how it came to be, because I think you know so many you use of color are, you know, so spread out 
that the gaslighting, um, you know, it sometimes starts to work and we, we start to wonder, wow, is it really that way? And then we see something like this that comes along and we're like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, so, you know, for those of us that are, that are lucky enough to be able to have community um, that helps reinforce to us what we know to be true, something like this, this book is a gift to the community to, to really say no. It really is true. And if you're that one you, you of color in that one congregation um, that you don't have community yet, please get community, blue, drum, all the ways. But if you don't, there's there's people who are writing about this. This is part of our of our history. And and that's the beauty of you all taking the time to do this book, right? Is that this is now part of our collective shared history. We need to give a shout out to Kiana Perkins, who said, we have to be super magical. Kiana Perkins is an amazing black woman who is the social justice coordinator at the Ann Arbor UU Church. And she goes on to say, as a person considering marriage into this family, being a minister, it is not looking good. Yeah, hard truths, hard, hard truths. And that's the point. Let's look at those hard truths. And, and doesn't our faith, require those of us who through the characteristics of white supremacy culture, those of us more used to being able to dwell or find comfort uh, when we go to church say, or something like that, um, doesn't our faith require us to face right into those truths because of our common, um, uh, because we are, because what happens to one happens to all. And, um, and we're not fully human if we're not really looking at all of this. Doesn't it require us to, to look and to change um, in response? So we're sort of, we're hoping that if, as we hope that the book has a life now that it's out in the world, that she, she, I think of her as a she, um, that she uh, grows into um, her own adulthood and, um, and with its partialness, you know, the, these important pieces, like Antonio, you said, and that are showing up in the comments, the important pieces about our youth, um, you know, I hope there's another book uh, exactly about that. Um, uh, in its partialness, that it helps, um, it helps to hold a, a, a bit of the sense of the wholeness of the of the of the work, the ups and the downs, and the and the worthwhileness, the pain. The very, very real pain, and um, and and the fact that we're called to it. You know, um, one of my colleagues said, uh, uh, "Gosh, your stories all show that it's really hard, and it's say it's hard on ministers to do the work. Um, do you think this will turn them away from it?" I said, "No. I, I hope it. I hope it gives white ministers, in particular, and white other lay leaders, the the sheer confidence that there's no one right way to do this." The only way to do it is to be in it and do the work of trying to build multicultural anti-racist beloved community. Karen. Oh, sorry, cool. I just wanted to give Karen an opportunity to have a closing word as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everything that Nancy said and more, it's, um, it's incredibly difficult work and yet we're all here today because we've chosen to stay in this work. Um, and uh, I, I really just want to thank the host for having us. And, and uh, it's, been, it's been quite an honor and a joy to be here with you today. Thanks for writing the book. It feels like companionship, you know, and we all need that. So it's companionship that goes into the deep places and the specificity of it, while people could say that makes it about someone else actually is universal in its particularity, I'll say. So, so thank you so much for all the really hard work that I know that you've put into it for a really long time. And mm -hmm. yes, may it, may it have a life and what a good time to have this book in the world. Aisha, thanks for um, being the consultant on it. And uh, you didn't describe your role so much, but um, anyway, we're gonna wrap up. We're coming to the top of the hour. Next week, we're gonna have a summer roundup uh, guest list. We've, you know, the four of us, well, five of us, maybe six if Margali comes back, never are short of topics. So <laughs> we'll be, we'll be uh, just checking in from the summer 
and sharing what's been going on in our lives. Thank you again so much to the authors of Mistakes and Miracles, which you can buy from the In Spirit bookstore online at the UUA, Congregations on the Road to Multiculturalism. Thank you. Antonia, take us off. <laughs> Don't end the video, just end us live on Facebook. Right. This is hilarious. What do we say that's <laughs> controversial? So follow us forever. We should say all the things that we usually say after the shows. Antonia, tap left. I usually say the controversial stuff like on the show. Live on Facebook, if you click on that. <laughs> Uh, either way, I guess leave the meeting. Is there other option? <laughs> we could talk through that. Um, we are we still on Facebook? We yeah. are still on Facebook. Well, hey. <laughs> <laughs>